service in particular focuses on the question that Pilate asked the crowd, what shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Christ? And we'll take a look at that question through the eyes of a number of people that Jesus encountered on the way to the cross. Our service will proceed uninterrupted, so the hymn numbers will not be announced, but they are on the board and in your worship guide, so I encourage you to take a look at that and be prepared. Readers are invited to come up forward when the music ends to begin their portion of the service. And our Lenten service, our Lenten journey be, finishes on Sunday morning as we gather for an Easter breakfast at 8.30 and then worship at 10 o'clock. And I encourage you to join us as you are able. Now that I said I wouldn't announce the hymns, I'm going to announce the first hymn, number 358, Great God, Your Love Has Called Us. I invite you to stand as you're able. Jesus, we have come to Calvary with you this day. We seek to know the agony that you suffered there. Have mercy on us, for we your suffering. Teach us to endure as you endured the scorn of unbelievers and the torments of our enemies. Make us whole and act for you. Save us from despair when we are circled round about. Help us keep our faith in you strong forever. When we forget our promises, refresh our memories. When we face death, be with us and give us courage and hope. Help us today to relive your death. And to understand why God is the cross for us. I invite you to be seated.
A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, the 26th chapter. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the church, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse and he swore an oath. I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Christ? How do you suppose Peter would have answered that question? I can tell you how he would have answered it earlier that night, the night of Jesus' betrayal and arrest. In the upper room, far away from any angry mobs and arresting soldiers, Peter boldly declared his allegiance to Christ. When Jesus informed his disciples that one of them would betray him and all would forsake him that night, good old impetuous spur of the moment Peter stepped forward and boldly announced that all the others might do that, but he never would. Why would he be willing to go to prison for Jesus, even to die for him, if that ever became necessary? But what Peter said and what Peter did were two different things. When his allegiance to Christ was put to the test in the courtyard, Peter the rock crumbled. And in a shameless display of cowardliness, he not only denied his relationship to Jesus, but even resorted to cursing and swearing to get his point across. How easy it is for us to point an accusatory finger at Peter and shake our heads in disgust. And yet, how often have we done the same? The very same thing when we thoughtlessly went along with the crowd to avoid being singled out as different. Haven't we zipped our lips and said nothing when God laid before us a splendid opportunity to share our Savior with another? And so we pray. Forgive us, Lord, for our faltering loyalties and faint attachments to the cause of Christ. Pardon us for our all too frequent denials to the rest of the world of how much Jesus means to us. Give us courage to confess his name boldly before others in order that he might confess our name before you. 
อเมนGospel of Matthew, the 26th chapter. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment, he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. I suppose if there was one sentence to describe Judas, it would be so close and yet so far. I mean, think of it. Judas had been handpicked by Jesus to be one of the chosen 12. For three years, he had followed Jesus wherever he went. He had seen demons cast out of the most tormented of individuals. He had observed as Jesus made the blind to see the lame to walk, the deaf to hear, and the dumb to speak. He had seen Jesus feed the multitudes, walk on water, calm the storm, and even raise the dead. And in addition to all of that, he had been privy to the most intimate conversations Jesus had with his disciples. He had sat, sat at the feet of the master the source of all his wisdom and knowledge. And yet, in spite of all of that, and much, much more, when the time came for Judas to answer the question, what shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Christ? He turned his back on the Lord. And for a measly 30 pieces of silver, betrayed him into the hands of his enemies who sought to kill him. Have you ever thought or done that, my friends? Have you ever betrayed your Lord? Perhaps by the language you used or off-color jokes you told or laughed at? 
or maybe by shady business deals that you've made or by failing to make your worship of him a priority in your life. We all have to plead guilty, don't we? That's why we need a savior like Jesus. And so we pray. With shame, we confess, O oh Lord, that we have turned our backs on you far more times than we care to remember. Have mercy upon us. Wash us clean in your blood, Lord Christ, and restore us to fellowship with you once again. Amen. the Gospel of Matthew, the 26th chapter. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who is it that struck you? The Jewish council, also known as the Sanhedrin, was a body of 70 men who came from three different classes of religious leaders, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. These were the religious elite of Jesus' day. These were the ones who were well-versed in the Old Testament scriptures. So if anyone would have been able to recognize the Messiah when he appeared on the scene, you would think it would have been them. But all they saw in Jesus was a threat, a threat to their authority, a threat to their popularity, a threat to the control that they had over their people's minds and lives. 
Though Jesus had many confrontations with these Jewish leaders throughout his ministry, everything came to a head following Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. John tells us in his gospel, so from that day, they plotted to take his life. Never mind the great good that Jesus was accomplishing. Never mind the many miracles he performed to prove his messiahship. Never mind the fact that many were being led into the kingdom of God through his powerful preaching and teaching. No, it seemed these leaders were blind to everything that Jesus was. And they were determined on seeing to it that he was removed from the picture, no matter what the cost. So when they were called upon to answer the question, what shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the, called the Christ? Their response was straight and to the point. He is worthy of death. And so we pray. Lord God, we pray that we might never be so blinded by Satan's efforts that we fail to see Jesus for who he is and what he is. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, may we daily confess him to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. And by your grace, may that confession be on our lips until the day that we die. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, the 27th chapter. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Pontius Pilate was a, 
a bundle of contradictions, wasn't he? Here he was, the representative of Rome in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus' arrest. He had the full authority of the empire to back up any decision that he might have to make. And yet, when he was hounded and pressured by the religious leaders to condemn Jesus to death, and they in turn used their power and influence to persuade a bloodthirsty mob to demand the crucifixion of Christ, Pilate caved in. Even though he himself had examined Christ and found him to be guilty of no crime, especially a crime deserving the penalty, death penalty, he lacked the moral conviction and the courage to let Jesus go free. He simply gave in to the pressure of the moment and the pressure of the crowd. And then he did something that people have been doing almost since the beginning of time. He refused to take the blame for his part in the travesty of justice and passed the buck back to the murderous mob. Can you see yourselves in Pilate, my friends? Oh, not that you would ever condemn to death the innocent son of God. But have you ever passed the buck of blame to, blame to someone else? Have you ever refused to re take responsibility for your actions or your inactions? Have you ever washed your hands of Jesus when the pressure of the moment or of the crowd got too much for you? And so we pray. Lord, we hate to say it, but we do see ourselves in Pilate today. We admit that we have played the blame game far too many times. From now on, help us to own up to our sins, knowing that then and only then can we become the blessed recipients of your forgiveness. Amen.
reading from the Gospel of Luke, the 23rd chapter. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had been wanting to see him for a long time, because he had heard about him and was hoping to see him perform some sign. What an unexpected opportunity for Herod. Here, standing before him, was the one that he'd been hearing so much about. Jesus, the great miracle worker from Nazareth. He had been the talk of the town. The topic of many a conversation around Herod's table. And no doubt, Herod wondered what to make of it all. And now, he had the chance. Perhaps Jesus would put a little show on for him, walk across his swimming pool, change some water into wine, heal a crippling member of his court. Herod wanted Jesus on his terms. And oh, how often don't we do the same thing? Jesus, I'll believe in you, but you just have to do this miracle for me. Or Jesus, if you'll just take care of this problem of mine, I promise I'll be in church every Sunday for the rest of my life. Sorry, my friends, but it doesn't work that way. When we come to Jesus, we come not on our terms, but on his terms. He's the Lord. He's the one in charge. And even though we are not even the least bit worthy to enter into his presence, he speaks to us these beautiful words from John chapter 3. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. And so we pray. Lord, forgive us for the times that we've tried to bargain with you and treated you as though you could be bought or persuaded by our flimsy promises. Help us to come to you on your terms and to daily offer ourselves as living sacrifices to you. Amen.
A reading from the Gospel of Luke. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed have been condemned, un and we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come unto your kingdom. And he replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Sometimes it's amazing the impact Jesus can have on a person's life. While most of the time that impact is gradual and occurs over a period of time, once in a great while, it's instantaneous. That was the case for the thief on the cross. Had he been asked our theme question for today, what shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Christ? His answer would have likely have been different from the one he gave shortly before he died. For Matthew tells us in his gospel that at first both the thieves joined in with the rest of the crowd hurling insults at Jesus. But Luke's gospel suggests something strange happened to the heart of the one thief. Maybe it was Jesus' prayer of forgiveness for his executioners. Maybe it was the non-retaliatory way in which Jesus allowed himself to be nailed to the cross. Maybe it was the love and concern that he expressed for his mother from the cross. Whatever the case, almost instantaneously, the thief began to see Jesus through different eyes and by the grace of God beheld him as an innocent, spotless Lamb of God through whom he could gain entrance into paradise. And sure enough, Jesus granted him his dying wish. Is that how you see Jesus, my friends? As your innocent, sin-bearing substitute who alone is the way, the truth, and the life, the only means by which you will ever get to enter into the kingdom of heaven? Or do you still hold to, to the false and futile hope that Jesus isn't enough and that somehow you have to contribute to what he has already done for you? Somehow you have to earn your own ticket into paradise. And so we pray. Lord, we thank you that through Jesus, you have made eternal salvation a gift that just needs to be received by faith. Help us to understand that we can't earn it. We can't merit it. We can't buy it. But that's okay because it has already been paid for in full by the precious and priceless blood of Jesus. Amen.
A reading from the prophet Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded by our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises we are all healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the inequity of us all. We've covered a lot of territory today. We've heard how many of the most important personalities in the passion story would have answered the question, what shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Christ? And sadly, we've seen ourselves in many of their foolhardy responses to that question. Still though, there is one person in the passion story to whom we need to address this question. And that person is you. You do realize that you were there, don't you? Isaiah the prophet puts you there in chapter 53 of his book when he writes, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. So what will you do then with this Jesus who is called Christ? And before you answer that question, let me say that there is no straddling the fence with Jesus. As much as we would like to live our lives with one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom, Jesus tells us, he who is not with me is against me. So as far as Jesus is concerned, our commitment to him is an all or nothing thing. Either he lives as your Lord and Savior, or you cast him out of your life as a fraud who deserves to be condemned as a charlatan who is unworthy of your allegiance and your love. And so we pray. Lord, after all you've done for us and all you went through on the cross for us, there's no denying the fact that you are worthy of our utmost love and devotion. And yet so often we fail to give you what you deserve. Forgive us. Heal us. And change us so that we might always proclaim you as Savior and Lord in all that we think and do and say. Amen.
He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken from the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he has done no violence. And there was no deceit in his mouth. 